My name's Tom Pearce. Um, I've been a sound engineer, producer, sound designer, game audio designer, audio director, businessman for the last 40 odd years, I think, in the music business. And uh, I've worked with a number of major artists, uh, toured the world and elsewhere, as they say. Um, spent most of the 80s um, working for Elton John. Toured and worked with people like George Harrison, um, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck. And here I am now. The game industry is a lot younger than the music industry. And a lot of the technology within the game industry has, has evolved really over the latter part of the 90s into the first part of the 2000s. Once we went from being able to actually use a full music track, a stereo mix, to being able to take a track apart and to be able to code a track and to be able to add other instruments into it and to be able to make that track behave interactively in code, that was something where a lot of the game industry didn't have the experience. And there was actually, there was a, a game company in, in Holland, um, Streamline Studios, who were actually working on a production um, for a, another client. And the client had made this huge audio budget available because they wanted to do some really clever stuff. And the guys at Streamline, I mean, with all due respect to them, they're great coders. There was nobody in that company that knew what, how music worked or how audio worked. And so they were just looking around for somebody that thought, you know, oh, there's, there's this Tom Pierce guy, he's, he's worked in the music industry. Let's give him a call and, you know, can he help? I'd never come across this. And the fact that I could take one sound and then manipulate it in code to do all kinds of different things. I could change the pitch of it. I could change the way it behaved. I could change the way it started, the way it stopped. I could make it loop. I could even make it go backwards. I could play it in reverse going forwards. It was fascinating. It took a long time to learn it. But once we started messing around putting particularly music, right, proper recorded music into a game, and you start to see that, well, actually, there's a crossover here. You know, there's a business that the music industry really should understand. But there's also a music business that the game industry should really understand. And it's honestly, it is in the last couple of months that we've started talking to game companies and explaining how you can monetize music. I'm involved in setting up a company now called Flip Entertainment, and it's, this is what we do. We talk to game developers and say, look, you've got all this great music here, right? And you've done it on a buyout where you've given the composer a couple of grand and said, okay, like, make some music and we'll own it. And then you sit on it. It's great in the game, but it doesn't earn you anything. For example, you have a great piece of music in a game, say from three or four years ago. The game's dead and buried. People, most people have forgotten it. But that piece of music is still valid. It has a life outside of the game. And so to be able to take a piece of music from an old game that's no longer, the game isn't earning money, but to establish the music, like in a sync catalogue, for example, right? get it used in TV broadcasts, get it used under a documentary or an interview like this, where it's generating money. I have a really, really firm belief that VR in particular is going to revolutionise the music industry because it will give labels an opportunity to go back and to make the kind of content that used to make money. And what I mean by that is if you look at, look at all the most successful albums in the world, the really big sellers, like Sgt. Pepper, it's a concept album. It's based not around one song, it's based around a collection of songs with a theme, right, with artwork that goes with it. You know? Dark Side of the Moon. It's a concept album. It's still in the charts. It's still in the American Billboard Hot 100. Well, Download kind of killed that idea. There's no point investing that amount of money to make a conceptual album. If people are just going to cherry pick out one or two tracks, it kills the concept. VR, I think, is kind of going back to giving labels a, a reason to want to make a concept album. In the early 80s, we had MTV. And MTV was a massive revolution. And I think, you heard it here first, folks, 
I think VR is going to be the MTV of the 2000s because it gives record companies and artists and creatives that new, that new medium, that new injection of like, yeah, this is a cool format and we can do all kinds of new stuff, just like we could with MTV. You know, if you go back, look at, again, with MTV, look at the, the really great video clips that came out of that, Thriller. Right? Thriller was a 30 minute movie that was made specifically for, for MTV. Right? Dire Straits, Money for Nothing, amazing video. Peter Gabriel, Sledgehammer. This is all, you know, we had a format. It wasn't just TV. It was where creatives could go play. But labels also saw this is where creatives could go and play. And yes, it would cost us 80,000, 100,000 to make a video. But on MTV, we could earn that back by the end of the week. And the more creative it got, the more controversial it got, like particularly with like Sledgehammer, right? the more plays it got. Well, at 90 cents a second, yeah, go ahead and, and play my four minute video <laughs> several hundred times a day throughout the world. I think VR is going to give us that same thing. What I would really like to be able to do is to create a situation where they are dealing not just with a band, but with a producer in the situation where it's not just the musician saying, OK, yeah, I want my guitar to sound like this. You're going to have this arsehole of a producer say, well, actually, no, <laughs> he's wrong. And I want this, and I want this reverb set up, and I want this compressor setting set up, and I want this recorded now. And I want to do it as a real session. And I will be critical of the band, and I will be critical of the, the students as well. So, oh, come on, guys, we're on a budget. You know, this needs to be done. I, I love working like this. You know, you've got students at different stages in the course. Some of them don't know what a microphone is. Some of them have already done stereo microphone theory. What we've got at the moment is a basic drum setup, one that I know will work whatever the situation. You know. We've done a couple of things that are maybe a bit odd. The big 147 there, that's a mono ambient mic and we're going to compress the hell out of it. You know, so on its own, you know, if you just solo it, it's, it will sound awful. You know. But just bringing it in under the mix actually gives the kick drum and everything a bit more punch and a bit more power. You know. Whether or not we would need that right now would depend on the track. So, like I say, we've got a basic setup. I now want to hear the band play the song they're actually going to play because none of us have heard it yet. Now, so we're guessing. Once we've actually heard the song and heard the arrangement, then we'll actually refine how we're actually going to do things like the drum miking. Uh, for the guitar and the bass at the moment, um, we've kept it really straight. So it's literally just a single mic on the cabinet and a DI, and two lines in. On the piano, We've done an XY, pretty standard miking split, but I've got a pair of Royer 121s as a bloom line pair, but off to one side, off the shoulder of the piano. And it's a kind of an odd sound. You know, it's very good at giving you kind of the breadth of the piano, the, the width of the room of the piano, but it's not very direct. The XY pair over the strings, that's a very direct sound. So it gives us the, the opportunity to kind of balance things out. You know. But again, <sighs> The position of the microphones, we haven't heard the song yet. If it's going to be more ballad orientated, I'll maybe move the, the Bloomline pair a bit further away. Okay, so it softens the sound out. Right? If it's going to be quite rocky, then we'll move them a bit further up. So it's closer to the tighter end of the piano where it'll, it'll be sharper. What I'm trying to explain to them is kind of we're mixing now. No, the decisions we make now about microphone placement, etc., will help us when we actually come to mix. You know? And I, I hate this idea of like, yeah, we'll fix it in the mix or we'll fix it in mastering, because no, you won't. Get it right now, record the truth now, no, mixing becomes a lot easier. No. The, the flute's going to be interesting. She plays that in two very different ways. When she's playing normally, okay, the main sound of the flute is coming actually off the, off the mouthpiece. There's a certain amount down here under the keys and at the end of it, but the bulk of the sound is actually off the mouthpiece. But she's got this technique where she actually flips it that way and blows straight into the mouthpiece, not across it. There, that's a whole different sound. You've got a much more low end, you've got more depth to it. No. But of course, we've, as you can see, we've had to, uh, two completely separate mic setups because while she's playing here, the C12 is probably going to be good enough and it will sound really good. But when she does the flip, nah, 
good old 87 or something like that.